Please join us. Um, Mark Bertolini is one of the great CEOs uh, on the planet. And uh, Aetna, which is a company he leads, it was a big, important company long before he got there. But he has really done an extraordinary set of things to uh, refocus it uh, and to reorient his, his priorities there. And, and now he's got even more big ideas, which you'll hear about. I mean, he is trying to buy Humana, what's it, a $30 billion deal, something 37 like that? 37 point something billion dollar acquisition. He's in the middle of trying to get approved, so that would buy Humana. That's a big thing, and we'll talk a little bit about that. But even more specifically, he is really rethinking how healthcare ought to be delivered, and I think he'll probably have some thoughts on these issues of jobs uh, and the future of the economy that have been coming up throughout the day. Um, yeah, Simone, if you, if you go, you know how to do it? You hit, uh, if you go to the main page and then hit uh, start a live video, but you have to type in his name anyway. Uh, Carolee threw me by ending so fast. Because um, we've been broadcasting live on Facebook as well that's as great. on our website, and that's a new thing. And Simone is actually on, uh, on uh, what's, it, what's it called? The, on Periscope, so we're broadcasting live on Periscope and Facebook on top of our own live stream. Anyway, so you, you, are thinking different about healthcare. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the main reason why you have to think different? Well, what we have doesn't work, um, number one. <laughs> um, nobody's happy with what healthcare costs, what they have to pay out of pocket. Um, it's an incredibly wasteful and disconnected system. Um, I often use a rat maze on a screen when I describe how it works. Uh, and. And so um, the only way to fix something like that is to sort of stand out in the future and look at what you think it should be and look back at the current situation and say, how can I get that mess over here yeah. um, versus standing in the middle of it and trying to increment your way toward um, um, changing a, an industry. Now, I know when you were at Techonomy in uh, Arizona, I guess, two years ago, you were talking about turning Aetna into a sort of systems company, in effect, where a lot of what you did was technology back end for the entire American healthcare system. And you've made a lot of progress on that, I know. Now you're buying Humana, which is a very labor-intensive, hospital-oriented, people kind of business. What's the idea of combining those two together? What are you trying to achieve? Well, if you think about um, the way we should all define health, which is a healthy individual's productive, a productive individual is economically viable, and an economically viable person is happy. And if you do that, that individual, isn't that a good? That's a better deal than the absence of illness, um, and fix it when it's broken. And and so, if you think about it as that is the definition of health, and you do that person by person and community by community, then you need to have all the tools and the kit to sort of um, um, rebuild the healthcare system from the community up. And so one thing, one way to think about it is we need to have single payer by community. Yeah. Right? Single payer by community. Okay, explain that. From the bottom up. So instead of the government imposing um, a labyrinthian administrative system like they've um, sort of had this adventure with the Affordable Care Act, which is, you know, an action forcing event and a good starting point, we really need to get back to communities as the basis for work, communities as a basis for health, um, and it's that focus. I think if we were to think about it from a community standpoint, we can get more done quicker. So how does Humana plus Aetna make that possible? So Humana has um, a very um, strong focus on improving the quality of care as a way of managing the cost versus holding back or putting in gatekeepers to control access to care as a way of controlling cost. So in the past, health insurance, and I don't want to get too technical with this audience, but in the past, health insurance used to be about creating level risk pools where you could create a price. So you had healthy people and sick people. You had all sorts of people. You could create a price that could sell a product in the marketplace. The new model is, is that we should go after the risk, and instead of trying to control use, control severity, which means improving the health of the population, going after disease burdens. And that really has to be in the basis of the people you're taking care of, that community. So what is the disease Keeping burden? Keeping getting sick in the first place. Huh? Right, what is the disease burden? What are the economic, socioeconomic, cultural, environmental trends of that community? And how would we build a healthcare system to take care of that group of people? 
versus trying to design some utopian system and impose it on everyone. Um, it doesn't work that way. Well, I know you, even inside Aetna, you've you know, gotten all kinds of new things that you tried there and you've mm -hmm. extended to some of your clients, whether it's yoga or meditation. Mindfulness. Mindfulness, yeah. the things to keep people healthier. Um, but, but going to this issue of single payer for a community, that could sound to some like monopoly business stuff, right? I mean, how do we avoid it feeling like one company is taking too much control? It's not going to be one company. It's going to be each community <coughs> taking control. It shouldn't how be companies taking control. So think of, um, um, think of a community where the health system is designed to meet the needs of that community. So if they have a higher burden of diabetes or they have a higher burden of cancer, or it's a generally well community, the systems needed to take care of those individuals, the doctors, the technologies, the facilities, where they're located, how they're accessed, all need to be designed to fit the specific needs of that local community. What happened with the Industrial Revolution is we lost the sense of community in this country, mm. and a lot, in a lot of places around the world. And so people are hungering for that. 70% of the American workforce is disengaged. 20% actively disengaged. That means they're actually- from their work. They, from their work, they don't, right. Hey, now you're typing into the last two discussions, right? Right, and so if you have that level of disengagement, it's because corporations and organizations are designed to create obedient acquiescence to rules. Uh, we have rules, if you follow them, you stay here. I mean, this is not your typical CEO, keep going. And so what you have to do is you have to move to a human operating system, which is really community-based. You have to self-govern, you have to give trust and the only, way you give, the only way you get trust is you have to give it first. It's like love. You give love to get love. You give trust to get trust. Be concrete, though. In the healthcare system that you, Aetna plus Humana, right. in the American economy achieve, how will that work? We should provide for individuals, and this is what Humana does, whatever they need in order to stay healthy and out of the hospital. So if they need a ramp in front of the house, get them a ramp. If they need a ride to the grocery store, get them a ride to the grocery store. Um, if they need groceries, diapers, give it to them. So that's the kind of system you think you could help create and still have a good business and possibly inspire other systems like that to emerge. Humana is doing it today. Right, so you just want to get in on that. I want to take, I want to leverage that technology leverage to, a broader, to, a, to a broader population. Now another sure. thing you told me, you sort of said on the phone, if I understood you correctly, was that you, know, you used that word Uber, which is such a bogey word in yeah. business, <laughs> that you, you sort of are trying to make an Uber for healthcare. What did you mean by that? So we think, go back to this community-based model and population health is the technical term used for it. If we were able to, instead of having people get jobs at hospitals or at home health agencies or at corporations, we said to them, we'll create the logistics to allow you to make your skills available to your community yeah. so that if you're a nurse, you can go around the corner and take care of somebody in your neighborhood at a time and on your schedule that you're available. Then it's not about the job, it's about the work you're doing. And we have the technology to do that, to create those logistics, and to allow people to work in their own communities. Aetna has 22,000 employees that work from home full time. They never come to an office. Last year, we saved 48,000 metric tons from going in the atmosphere. They're 20% more productive. They're 2% turnover. They're 100% quality in their work. They're home for their families. They're there with their kids. And all they have to do is get eight hours of work in a 24-hour period. So if you take that model writ large, and healthcare is the perfect industry for it because it's a community-based local model, healthcare is all local, why wouldn't we try and make that happen? So the equivalent is the nurse is the driver and the patient is the, customer, is the passenger of right. the Uber. Yeah, okay. It's, it's a very interesting and, and exciting idea that I'm, I'm happy to see you attempting. And you know, you really are thinking differently about business and just to broaden it a little bit, you know, you raised the, the salaries of the lowest paid employees at all, all of Aetna in, in a fairly dramatic move not very long ago and you've gotten tons of, of applause for that, which I would like to applaud you for right now. Thank because you. he did do that, you know, this, what, how, what, was the, what was the statistics, how did you do it? Real quick. We took everybody from anywhere from twelve fifty to thirteen dollars an hour up to sixteen. Uh, but in realizing that when we raised their salaries, they would have to pay more for their health care because we have a salary determined contribution system 
We said for everybody that was under 300% of the federal poverty level, determined by an outside firm, no, we don't need to know that. We'll just find out if you're eligible. We'll wipe out your out-of-pocket cost sharing. As long as you engage in your health in a way that you take care of yourself, we'll take care of you. Wow, okay. And so for 7,000 people, we're going to impact personal disposable income by up to 33%. So you not only raise the, the salaries of the, or the hourly wage of the lowest people, but for an even larger group, you eliminated their health care costs. Right. Basically. Wow, that's out of pocket big, costs. Yeah, out of pocket. That's a very cool thing. And, and, and now to take that a little further, and, and before we get into some of the other radical ideas you have, I have to just point out, you know, you've got the black onyx skull ring, right? Isn't that a skull? Yeah. And you've got like beads that I can see through your shirt. Yeah, my mama beads. <laughs> and what's this thing around your neck here? That's like a... That's, um, that's uh, Sanskrit for so hum. I am that. We are all one. All of I us are that. the same thing. Okay, and I don't know, you're, you have long sleeves on, but usually you have some bracelets. I have, yeah, I have bracelets and I have tattoos and you stuff like don't that. Have bracelets I didn't want to show all the tattoos. You just don't today. watch, come on. Anyway, and you got the alligator boots, but yep. so you're not thinking like your typical CEO. I mean, I think that that's a given, <laughs> which we love that. That's one, that's one of the main reasons you're sitting here instead of, you know, I don't know, some. Every once in a while, somebody graduates from Wayne State University after eight years and sneaks into the which C-suite. Which he did, he came to, he went to Wayne State. Eight years. Eight that's, years at Wayne State. That's how you knew I was serious. My brother, my brother was a year behind me. He used to say that you know Mark was a sophomore when I joined Wayne State, and he was a sophomore when I graduated. <laughs> hey, you made something out of. But I had fun. Of, I think you made something out of yourself. So, you now have been talking to leaders in Washington, not just about how to get Humana approved, because I know that's something you're talking about, but about a whole lot of ideas you have about making the economic system different, and we called this creating the next generation of capitalism. Mm -hmm. You used that phrase when we were talking on the phone. What do you mean by creating the next generation of capitalism? Because I think a lot of people here would like to figure out what that means. So there's this book by Thomas Piketty on um, capitalism in the 21st century. And uh, on equality. Yeah. Uh, inequality, income inequality. And, and, you know, and I grew up in the east side of Detroit, the city of Detroit here, and you know, grew up in a family that you know, worked hard. My parents both worked. My dad was a pattern maker in the auto industry. My mother was a nurse. We didn't have insurance some of the time. Um, as a family, there were six of us in seven years. I was the oldest. And we lived in a 1,200-square-foot you know, house you know, with one bathroom. So you know, it was a very different life. And so we grew up in that kind of environment. And, and, and I said, you know, now that I'm in charge of this big company, maybe I could start to have a conversation about doing it. So one of the goals I had when I became CEO of the company was to reestablish the credibility of corporate leadership in the eyes of the American public. So oh, that's all? That's all. Just, you know, kind of easy. Oh, come on. Do I'm, I'm, hard. I'm working on it. And so um, we had, um, we, we, I got the copy of the You have a long way to go on that, but keep Yeah, going. I know. I'm working. Um, and so we, I got a copy of the book for everybody for Christmas on my leadership team and said, read this. Piketty's book. I got Piketty's book. That's, and I that's said, why don't you read this? You, 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 why don't you read this book? Because this is the alternative. This was the radical book that really elevated the discussion about right. inequality on a global basis, really criticizing capitalism as a fundamentally unfair system, is more or less one of his... Well, I think it's a dated system. And so I think we have an opportunity to change it. Yeah. And so I'm part of a group of CEOs that started with a handful of us. There's now over 40 of us called Higher Ambition Leaders that talk about how corporations can do good and also do well. And it's not an original um, um, concept. Devon Chenard from Patagonia actually wrote a great book, if you want to read it. It's the Bible I use. I have copies of it in my office. I give it to people called Let My People Go Surfing. And it was about how he thought differently about the workplace and how he could make it a better place. And so we've begun this dialogue about what are all the things we could do. Um, and you know, we, we, one of those was increasing the wage. and and personal disposable income of our employees. Something you could do, but how do you do that? How do we broaden that nationally? Well, I, you know, so, um, um, you know, Doug, Doug McMillan from, from Walmart was up on a stage a few months ago, and they said, you know, you're raising your wage for Walmart. Why did you do it? And he said, that guy, and he pointed at me in the audience. He said, I can't get to 16 right away, but I'm working on it. And so I think we're talking about it as groups of CEOs and saying, how do we get at this issue? Because why should we let capitalism reinvent itself, it won't happen by itself. Why should we let income inequality grow? Why shouldn't we do something about it and try and find a better way? And, and so for our employee population, I think a lot of employee populations, bringing everybody along with the economic recovery is cheap 
compared to what could happen if we have continued disengagement among our workforce and the quality of our products and services. Now, I know you have some specific ideas of policy changes you'd yes. like to see. Could you just talk about a couple of those? So sure. So we treat machinery uh, from an accounting and an, an economic standpoint better than we treat people. So when I invest in computers or technology, and we invest a lot, um, over a billion dollars a year as a company, I get to depreciate that machine and that investment over time. And so its impact to my earnings is over a longer period of time. When I train a person, I have to expense all of it immediately. Hmm. So when it comes to should I invest in a machine that could do that person's job, or should I invest in a person and make them better, make them happier, make them a better part of my system, get trust from them, the economic rationale will be the machine's cheaper to do. Wow. I can tell the machine what to do. That's what the machine will policy do makes you do now, in effect. That's what, the, that's what the, the financial accounting standards cause you to do. So why shouldn't we look at capital investment in people the same way we do in machines and make us indifferent yeah. to that investment? That's a wonderful way to look at it. Yeah. Right? The second is, is that we have assets that when they, go, when they go from day 365 to 366 and we sell them, they become more valuable because we get capital gains tax treatment. It goes from ordinary taxes to 20%. Why shouldn't we have a sliding scale from 100% down to zero over eight years so that we make longer term investments in a longer term view of how the market um, should cause us to invest over the long term. So we no longer give quarterly guidance as a company. We just stopped doing it. That's so we're not going to do that, though. right? Thank we're not going to talk about doing that. Hate quarterly. Um, I've asked shareholders who have been unhappy with our policies because they want higher dividends <laughs> that maybe they should get out of our stock. And they did. And they did. Yeah, a lot of big investors got out of your yep. stock. And so That's a real endorsement. If you don't, and so you, you can have a conversation that says, here's what we stand for as a company. Here's why our people are important. And I have to tell you, the people that applauded the loudest when we did this for our employees were our shareholders. Yeah, I mean, the real smart shareholders understand. And our stock's up 38% since we did it. Nice. So. Now, I know you've been talking to people in Washington, including Hillary Clinton, mm -hmm. um, about these kinds of ideas? I mean, are you advising her? Or what? Well, no, we're advising a lot of people. So we're trying to get people engaged in this conversation as the kind of dialogue we should have in this election versus all the other bullshit. People that on goes both on sides on of the aisle. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, right? I mean, both sides. Well, I there's mean, a lot of bullshit, but you're, but you're talking to Republicans and Democrats then. Well, I'm talking to both sides and saying, why don't we talk about something that's real for people and important? Um, why don't we, you know, get. Why don't we get that? Why don't we just have a debate about that? Let's talk about income inequality and what we're going to do about it. And let's get rid of the rhetoric of pointing fingers and the incivility of blaming people and say, how can we make this actually work? And, and, and put some real ideas on the table, like changes in accounting policy, changes in the way we treat people. Um, you know, um, the minimum wage increase for us would have wouldn't have mattered because we didn't have anybody making less than $10 an hour. So how does that help by just telling everybody you've got to have $10 an hour? Why shouldn't it be you should be paying what you can afford and you should take care of people? Well, even when Doug McMillan says he can't afford 16, you've got to ask, why is that? What is it you're prioritizing over that? But anyway, that's another matter. Well, I think he's, uh, got, I mean, he's got a lot more people. Well, he's got a lot of people and he's got a lot of shareholders and he's got a lot of other issues. But you know, there's, the thing I like about you is you've been willing to take some hits just because it was the right thing to do. I mean, of course, you're a much smaller company than Walmart, so I'm not really trying to yeah. hammer them, but no, they're a good company. I love the way you have just sort of said, <clears throat> certain things are right and we're gonna do them differently. I mean, even the you know, mindfulness at uh, work. I mean, it's really interesting, and I, I don't, I wanna, we've got a little more time. I wanna get audience in on some of this, but let's see if there's any other major thing. I mean, you were talking, well, let, let's see if anybody in the audience has some questions and, uh, or comments. Can we get the light up? and? Uh, can I see, anybody want to ask this amazing business leader a question or a comment? Here. Okay, right there. Um, can we get the mic? Thank you. <clears throat> Identify yourself. Jill DeHaven from Santa Fe, New Mexico. Not Detroit. Sorry. Well, Happy to be here, though. This is great. Um, is there a size city that the, your community-based health care works in? Is there a scope of that? Or is any town, anywhere... 
open to this? It's a great question. It's, it's a great question. There are, there are um, any size will work as long as all the parties are willing. So it requires a conversation. Uh, and, and so we have three towns that we're trying to do it in. I won't pre-announce them yet, but we will be launching. So you pick the towns? We pick the towns. These are the sort of test beds. We're, we're their test beds. <laughs> we're actually gonna provide products for sick people. So we're gonna offer a diabetic health plan for people that are diabetics to try and get them engaged. And so we're gonna make these kinds of investments because we believe that if we go actually take care of people who are chronically ill better, we create more room in the system to make investments in wellness so that people, because wellness is a 20 year journey that we never take because the payoff's too far away. But if we can create more room in the current system and make that investment at a community level, because Santa Fe is gonna be very different than Midtown Manhattan. Okay, who else has got a comment or question? Okay, right there, the mic is nearby anyway. Go ahead, give it to her. And then we'll come over to you. Hi, my name is Alice Agadema. I'm a junior here at Wayne State, double majoring in business marketing and PR. And um, I actually have your health care insurance. So I just want to thank you because it's really good. And um, just to hear your views and your standpoint and on your vision, just how you just continue to keep um, it flourishing and blooming over the years. It's just really great to know. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, comments are fine just as well as questions. So thank you for that. Over here. <clears throat> Especially when they're comments like that. Uh, Matt's Lilliland, uh, entrepreneur, live in Boston. Uh, great comments you were making there. I'm just curious when you, uh, I was very uh, interested in the depreciation, to, you know, people versus machines. When you brought that up in DC, what was the reaction? And, uh, great. and somehow the lobbying side that I would completely agree with you running various companies, but what about the accounting lobby? Would, would they go against it? Uh, what are, are there any lobbying factors against something like this? Yeah, what are the opposition? Well, the, 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 the opposition is um, very much a Washington thing. If you open up one part of the tax code, everybody will want to open up the rest of it. Oh. And, and so you can't just tweak one thing without opening the whole thing up. And nobody wants to take the whole thing on, which we need to. It's labyrinthian. It doesn't work well. Um, it needs a lot of work, and, and nobody's been willing to take that on for a long, long time. 83 or 84, I think, was the last time we touched the tax code. And then there's this whole issue of corporate tax versus personal tax, and whether you do both of those at the same time, and, and all these other sorts of things. And so people get caught up in the process. It's sort of like the Vietnam War talks, should the table be round or square? Um, and nothing gets really settled in getting into the work and actually putting frameworks together. You know, one of the things about this odd political season we're in is that certain things are getting on the table that have not been on the table in a long time. I think Bernie Sanders' success is quite interesting and dovetails with some elements of what you're talking about. And a lot of things even Donald Trump is talking about have resonated because he's putting things on the table that have not been in the dialogue. And the other day, when he, for example, said that CEO pay is obscene, that's not something you hear national political figures talking about. I'm curious. CEO pay, from the standpoint of many you know, non-CEOs, uh, is an issue that underscores some of this inequality thing. Now, you're a CEO who makes quite a bit of money. What do you mm -hmm. think about that? So my salary hasn't increased for eight years. Um, and I've made all of my money on the stock of the company. And so when I took over, the stock was at $29.85 and a share. And today, it's at $118 a share. Now, for that, you should make some money. Yeah. Right, and so that's where I make that's my, what paid for. that's what I get paid for. But my salary has remained the same and hasn't gone up. And, and when I took the job, I said I didn't want my salary to go but up. But what about the culture of CEO pay? Does it, does it upset you? I, you know, I think the dialogue is an important one. I think we need to talk about income inequality. I think the pay ratio thing is gonna create all sorts of noise that's not gonna be meaningful to folks. Um, I think if we took care of everybody, um, it wouldn't be as big an issue, but as the income inequality divide grows, you're gonna look at the people at the very top and say, well, why should they make that money? What did they do to deserve that? And I think it, it gets villainized um, in a lot of ways, and people don't understand the structure of it and don't care to. And what about Sanders? What do you, I'm just curious what your perspective is on his astonishing progress. I mean, that, that somebody who's an avowed socialist should be getting crowds of 30,000 people <laughs> coming to fill stadiums in the United States is a big change from the way it's been for really since I, since I was like 20 years old. Um, and even then it was like somebody else, not a national politician. 
What does that mean to you? So I, I have a home in Vermont, and I love Vermont. And, and, I, and sometimes I joke that Vermont <coughs> is Cuba with snow. Um, yeah. and, <laughs> and the tax structure is very heavily weighted against people that are not residents. Yeah. Um, but you know, when I go up there, the roads are clean, they're, they're, you know, they're, they're, they're paved, the place is beautiful, everybody's happy. And you know what? I'm willing to pay for that. And I, and I should be willing to pay for that. And so if we all are willing to pay for a better quality of life, then those that have it should. And so I think his dialogue's a reasonable one. Um, I think you know, when we get to the how do you actually make it happen um, is, is, is the harder part. Because no sooner do you have these great ideas, you get to the fact of, OK, now I've got to take my really great idea and actually do it. Um, that's when you really learn how difficult and Just to stick are. on this political thing, one more, you know, your group of 40 CEOs, are you talking to people like Jeb Bush too? Is that, I mean, are we trying We're to- We're talking to everybody. You know, we had Al Gore in to talk about um, um, sustainable capitalism and how we think about the environment. And so we, you know, Aetna last year started 119 urban farms in communities to eliminate food deserts. We dedicate, we now have a cookbook on how to create urban farms and we fund each one, including how to connect to farm to table, farm to market and farm to school so that they become sustainable after the first year. And these things are doing great. I'm just curious, you get in vertical farms too, the indoor farms, is that in No, no, we're doing just, you know, just urban, outdoor, urban, inner city, like urban they farms, land, like so they have extra land, land okay. just to try to eliminate food deserts. Cool, um, we got time for one more question or comment. Okay, back in the back, I see a hand, let's just go for it. Uh, hi, Mike McBride with Salesforce. Mark, welcome back to Detroit. Uh, so Thanks. excited to see you on the slow roll. Um, that was great. The slow roll is the best party in town. Awesome? If you have not done the slow roll, do it. That is a party. What, what is that for those who are watching our slow, live stream? Slow roll, so slow roll is a bike ride that started with a bunch of guys, like 100 people. Uh, one of my friends is one of the original 42 that started, got involved in it. Last night, we had 4,000 bicycles. Last night? Last night. 4,000 bikes. That's why I came here earlier. Every Monday night. Every Monday night was 15,000 bikes last Monday. Wow. Um, 4,000 bikes, and they roll through Detroit, and they have the Detroit, the Detroit Police Department blocks off the roads. It's a two-hour ride. I thought the roads were all blocked off anyway. You know, well, most of them. Have, <laughs> oh, okay. It's construction season. It is, yeah. We well, that's it's very a slow cool. roll is really cool. So you got cool. a question? <laughs> well, we take a different route every Monday, and it's really cool. It's a great way to see the city. Are you? Were you there last night? Yep, yep, yep. So it's a great ride. I'm just curious. You know, you, you're born on the east side. Same with me. Uh, you're back in Detroit now. You spend some time here. Obviously, you have a lot of family. How do you think we're doing in Detroit, and what's your perspective on how we're doing, and what do we need to do to get over the proverbial hump? So I, I, I live in New York City, and, and my daughter lives in Brooklyn, and we, I go back and forth, uh, Mari and I, my partner and I, go over and see her often. There's two billboards now in Brooklyn that say, next stop on the L train, Detroit. And, and so there is a huge transformation occurring of people that have gentrified Brooklyn and could no longer afford it coming here and starting to gentrify Detroit, and you can see it. Yeah. It is palpable. I mean, I was on my bike this morning riding around downtown and out to Belle Isle um, for a ride this morning, and you can see the difference just up and down Jefferson Avenue, which used to be you know, life-threatening at times um, to be able to go on that stretch of road. And, and so I think it's really cool what's happening here, and I'm excited by it. Um, and you know we're gonna we're gonna be taking a look here to see what we can do in town to help as well as a company. It's a great place, so it's coming back. Awesome. Thank you so much. That's a great way to end, Mark. Thank, thank you, you for coming. Good to see you. Dean. Thank as you for always. showing what Wayne State can do. And yep. uh, and and we just we just love.